We good to go? Yes, go ahead, Darren. Yeah, right. All right. So it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome today's speaker, Rachel Boone, um, Curator of Computing and Communications at the Science Museum right now. But Rachel's connection with society goes way, way back to an earlier part of her career when she was, uh, amongst other collections, uh, looking after the computing collection at the Science Museum. And she was the chief uh, liaising point between the society when uh, the society is very active in restoration and conservation at the museum. And Rachel was the chief uh, liaising point. And uh, I well remember the respect and appreciation with which everyone who worked, everyone in the society who worked with Rachel, uh, you know, viewed the attentive, um, uh, the attentive attention she gave to um, our various needs, which were multiple at the time. Um, Rachel left, um, I believe, to go to uh, Manchester Museum of Science and Industry, and we were very sorry to see her go. And she has since migrated back to the Science Museum, and I must say we're all delighted that she chose actually to do a PhD in the history of computing, which sort of um, yeah, resonates with, um, uh, with our interests, of course. Um, the topic today is, is highly intriguing because everyone has heard of Tommy Flowers and the role that uh, Dollis Hill and uh, Tommy Flowers played in the construction of Colossus. But the actual context of the Dollis Hill, uh, the PR research station is actually something of a black hole in the, in the history of computing narrative. And so what we can look forward to this afternoon is that the black hole will have some light shed on it by what Rachel has to say. So huge welcome, Rachel, welcome back as it were, and over to you. Uh, Rachel, I think you're muted. It's oh, okay. stream. I don't mind. Can oh, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry? Yes. Okay. I think we're good. Brilliant. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for that introduction, Doran. It is um, a real privilege to be back at the Science Museum and working um, with the Computer Conservation Society again. Um, I always look forward to our um, regular meetings. So it's a really great honour to uh, be invited to talk. So um, to begin, good afternoon everyone um, in the room and online. My name is Rachel Boone and as Doran said I'm Curator of Computing and Communications at the Science Museum in London. I'd really like to thank the Computer Conservation Society for inviting me to speak today to such an eminent audience. <laughs> With the chuckle. <laughs> You are. Um, the Post Office Engineering Research Station at Dollars Hill in Northwest London was Britain's leading establishment for communication research in the mid 20th century. Drawing on research from my PhD, this paper will show that Dollars Hill was a unique establishment, not accounted for by patterns described in existing literature on state, academic or industrial research. My PhD was the middle of three projects funded by the AHRC, looking at the history of Dollars Hill, and my specific project uh, was a collaboration between the University of Manchester, BT Archives and the Science Museum. I'm going to start by providing a short history of the post office research station up to the end of the 1930s. As I will show, staff at Dollars Hill were working on a vast range of activities, from improving telephone equipment to postal mechanisation. While the focus of their activities were telecommunications, Given today's audience, I've selected case studies which show Dollis Hill's contribution to the history of computing. The code breaking machine Colossus, the post-war computer Mosaic, and the premium bonds machine Ernie. By considering these technologies in the context of their own time, I will demonstrate that the research station's anomalous identity enabled it to move beyond its remit of investigating cost savings, setting standards, and developing new technologies to improve communication services owned and operated by the post office. To play a significant and largely undiscussed role in the Second World War, post-war reconstruction and Cold War. Rather than focusing on the fine technical details of technologies built at Dollars Hill, this paper is interested in the organisational conditions by which post office staff ended up developing these devices, thereby taking a socio-technical systems approach. Planning for a post office research station could be traced back to 1914, when the Postmaster General Charles Hawkhouse inspected the laboratories used by the GPO research department in London. 
The merger between the post office and the National Telephone Company in 1912 had led to an establishment of a new internal branch, the research section. The combined staff placed an enormous strain on the limited laboratory space at GPO West and King Edward buildings in London. After his visit, Pophouse agreed that research department needed its own permanent facility to support post office services, including research into telephone lines, telegraph apparatus and other mm -hmm. postal technologies. A rural area of northwest London called Dollars Hill was identified as a suitable site to build a research station. Away from the city, where the high cost of land would have prevented a central London location, this suburb offered the ideal environment for research activities, protected from traffic vibration and acoustic and electromagnetic disturbances. Plans were put on hold with the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, as the post office redirected its, its attention to support the war effort. This conflict highlighted the strategic value of telecommunication technologies, as telephone and telegraph networks were expanded across the country and mainland Europe. This also gave further impetus to the post office to establish a new research station. In 1920, the Treasury authorised the purchase of eight acres of land on the Dollis Hill site. Um, the first researchers moved in the following year and were housed in temporary ex-army huts, which had been converted into laboratories, workshops and offices. The site grew rapidly during the 1920s, with the erection of permanent buildings designed in collaboration between the post office and Office of Works. Architectural details included, quote, research is the door to tomorrow, and, quote, to strive to seek to find engraved into the archway over the entrance, which communicated the ethos of the research station to staff and visitors. From 1921, Dollis Hill housed the research branch and the radio branches research section, two parts of the engineering and engineering chief's office, which sat within the engineering department. The engineering chief's office consisted of several other branches, which were responsible for maintenance, testing and development, but did not have a research function. Although the research branch was restructured several times and new studies were introduced, research consistently fell into the following areas. Signaling apparatus and circuits, telegraphs, cable research, telephone apparatus, telephone lines and transmission, materials, which included the physics, chemistry and metallurgy groups, and systems for postal activities. The radio branch was responsible for expanding, managing and developing radio equipment installing receivers and transmitters, microwave communication, and helping to introduce television. Its activities were also regional, including the rugby and Criggan radio stations, as well as smaller sites. Between its official opening in 1933 and 1958, which were the periods of my research, the research station at Dollis Hill expanded from an institution of around 100 staff, testing, calibrating, and improving equipment in newly constructed laboratories and converted ex-army huts, to around 1,300 scientists and engineers undertaking a vast range of pure and applied research in a severely congested site. The research station's uniqueness was shaped by being part of the post office, itself an anomalous component of the British state, as an income generating government department responsible for maintaining and providing the nation's telecommunications services. Post office ambitions to improve and expand services were hampered by the short term fiscal policies of its funding department, the Treasury. Although governments changed, Treasury attitudes remained consistent across the period that the telephone was not a necessity and post office capital was a means, a means to aid macroeconomic needs. While this impeded the post office's ability to install um, tried and tested technologies, Treasury funds were more forthcoming for research which promised British innovation and new export markets. Within this environment, I show that Dollars Hill became an important means by which the post office could progress in some of its long-term aims when encumbered by government policies and bureaucracy. Um, I'm just going to double check, I've not skipped a slide. No. <laughs> the purpose of Dollars Hill was publicly presented by the post office as undertaking research to maintain and improve the efficiency of its services. However, defence requirements had a far greater influence on the research station's work than contemporary descriptions portray. I extend the work of Alice Hay, who identified the role that the military played in shaping the research culture at Dollars Hill after the First World War, to show that this continued into the 1950s. 
The research station's unique identity was used by senior post office staff to navigate between military and civilian requirements. And I trace how this flexibility was advantageous to the post office, as it could associate itself with the needs of the state to further, de de to further departmental aims. But at times, the expectation that Dollars Hill would support the wider government's defence and civil agenda distracted from post office's needs. Whilst Dollars Hill operated in a state which was guided by both warfareist and welfareist priorities, as David Edgerton suggests, its research could not be exclusively characterised by either, yet was integral to both. During the 1930s, the activities of the research station were successfully used by the post office managers as part of a wider publicity campaign to project a modern, efficient and technologically progressive government department. Beginning in 1932, <coughs> this initiative was designed to challenge criticism from the public, politicians and industry that the low uptake of post office services was because the department was inefficient and underdeveloped. Postmaster General Kingsley Wood was the force behind post office modernization and was committed to improving the department's public relation, uh, reputation. In 1933, Wood hired Stephen Talents as controller of public relations to oversee this revitalized department, a new role on the post office board and the first in a government department. Dollis Hill and its research activities were represented by the post office as the antithesis of criticisms to defend the department's monopoly over communication services and to build public trust. The research station could show the scale of the on-the-scene work that went into technologies um, of, the, of the post office services and to challenge um, views of government departments as being inefficient. Outputs from Dollars Hill promised to reduce costs and promised and provide better services, which countered criticism that post office services were underdeveloped and expensive. Research at the site already had the attributes of being forward looking, <clears throat> progressive and modern, all the features the publicity campaign was seeking to align with the post office. This image was delivered through the grand opening of Dollis Hill in 1933, posters, films, new services like Tim, the speaking clock and exhibitions. Whilst the research station's status as a symbol of prestige for the post office was recent in publicity terms, its reputation was well established among academic and industrial networks, nationally and internationally. Excuse me for a second. During the 1930s, <clears throat> that hasn't helped, <laughs> just sound worse. During the 1930s, the research station was used by managers in the engineering department to navigate professional networks, to gain patronage and further prestige. Driven by the status of the research station, professionalization became a priority with new research facilities, academic publications and further study prioritized for staff. The research station strengthened its role in national and international networks through collaborative transnational projects, undertaking contracted work for industry and defining global standards. Despite taking on some work to support the military services, during this period, research at Dollars Hill was focusing on meeting civilian services requirements. The impact of the post office's new commitment to modernize was recognized immediately. The public perception that the post office was inefficient changed rapidly with congratulatory articles appearing in newspapers and positive responses in parliament. The nature of the, tele of the telephone and the expansion to new users was not easy, um, easily or quickly scalable. Whilst the post office had successfully utilised advertising exhibitions and press attention to portray itself as a rapidly improving service at the forefront of technological research, a gap began to emerge between the promise of the services and the reality that they may not be as readily available as advertised. Another discord that emerged during this period is how the research station and its activities were presented publicly and what was omitted from that image. To the public, the resources at the research station were dedicated to improving the public telephone service. However, by the end of the 1930s, it was increasingly directing its resources to military need. During the Second World War, Dollis Hill became an integral part of the wartime state as its identity shifted from being predominantly a civilian research establishment to operating as a mainly military site. 
A key actor during this change was Gordon Bradley, who was promoted to staff engineer in charge of Dollis Hill on the 1st of January 1939. Bradley was Dollis Hill's main advocate during the period, dri driving the relationship um, of the research station with the government and other stakeholders in the rearmament program and Second World War. Today, I will show that this was driven up, driven as much by the desire to gain patronage, resources, and prestige from military departments as out of a sense of duty to the nation. And I'll also demonstrate that Radley was motivated by the conviction that the, that post office expertise was unsurpassed by any other research group in a wide range of areas. It's through Dollis Hill's relationship with Bletchley Park, the main wartime station of the Government Code and Cyber School, that anything is more widely known about its work during the war. Most writing focuses on the research station's role in code breaking uh, by building the first purpose built programmable computer, Colossus. Several books have been written about Colossus, and while some feature the experiences of the engineers who built it, most notably Tommy Flowers, most scholars have situated its history within a narrative about Bletchley Park. However, code breaking was not just about computing power. The challenge of intercepting and breaking enemy messages was a collaborative activity, bringing together several government and military organisations. The post office was a constant presence in all these activities, from installing new interception transmitters and receivers, to laying cables through which these scrambled messages were directed to, to um, cryptographers. Part of a national information system, the researchers at Dollars Hill developed the physical infrastructure to transport, visualise, intercept and decode information. Given the strategic value of communication routes, the post office played an important role in supporting national defence during rearmament and war by prioritising government telephone calls over civilian, installing new cables for military purposes and through staff who left in their thousands to support the war effort. Whilst the research station was considered a site of expertise in some areas, uh, notably telephone tapping, its authority was also challenged by new and expanding R&D establishments, managed or influenced by the defence and supply ministries. Although collaboration between institutions was common, there was also competition over limited resource and prestige. As a government department, there was an expectation from across government that the post office would support the needs of the wartime state. However, the transformation of Dollis Hill from a civil civilian site to a military establishment was also a strategy adopted by senior post office staff to safeguard its workforce. Research at Dollis Hill was steadily directed to meet the growing requests of the armed forces, and staff were seconded to other R&D establishments. Faced with the threat of further staff losses, Radley advertised Dollis Hill's availability to defence organisations, thus being seen to support the government, and better embedding the research station into the wartime state while protecting its resources. The post office's control over Dollis Hill was also challenged by the government's decision to use the site as a refuge for Whitehall departments at risk from aerial attack. This included the construction of the alternative cabinet war rooms, paddock, um, which I'm not going to talk about today, but can talk about in the questions if you're interested. Um, and despite becoming redundant, um, as the risk of air raids faded, the post office was restricted from accessing this much needed space. Despite having much less authority than R&D sites run by the service and supply ministries, Radley positioned Dollars Hill as a site of unique value to the wartime state. Dollars Hill became a network, became part of a network of research establishments which had been expanded or conceived for the war. This graphic is just a kind of snapshot of all the, some of the different departments that um, it worked directly with. Post office engineers worked with these, with these sites at different levels, sitting on committees, <coughs> taking collaborative projects with, and completing work for different organisations. With limited resources and several R&D establishments working on similar projects, there was as much competition as collaboration. And Radley was most successful at selling post office expertise to military departments without their own research establishments, such as those connected with human intelligence gathering. In contrast, the research branch found it harder to influence established R&D, as shown in its support of co-breaking activities at Bletchley Park. The research station was already willing to support the war effort by accepting this range of projects, but Radley's desire to pay, play a more active role in national defence was also a tactic to maintain staff levels. 
Senior staff had already been seconded away, and although some posts were backfilled, others were not. A similar approach was adopted by the Executive Committee of the National Physical Laboratory, who encouraged the laboratory to take on extra work to retain skilled staff who were at risk of being transferred. Bradley justified the claim that, quote, it appears essential in the national interest that the branch should be maintained as a unit by arguing that the training and experience of his staff meant that they were well placed to speedily tackle pro pro problems which might arise during the war. Although all government departments were working towards Britain's success in the war, um, there was this competition um, with R&D establishments and industry for space, resources, prestige and patronage from key stakeholders, or as Radley described them, quote, customers. <laughs> Radley used every opportunity to promote Dollis Hill, driven by his belief that his staff were better engineers than those in other research establishments. And this attitude wasn't unfounded. As a research station was approached by outside bodies because of the experience they'd had to, um, demonstrated before the war. However, following rearmament, Donners Hill became one of several R&D sites working on communication technology. And um, researchers and scientists in these, in these other establishments had greater opportunities to influence key wartime individuals than the post office, who still had to answer to the Treasury. The research branch through its role in wartime committees and its professional relationships was dominant and unchallenged in many areas. Nonetheless, Radley was still keen to diversify the types of project being undertaken by the research station on behalf of um, the wartime state, attempted um, by selling post, the selling of post office expertise. This was demonstrated in the project to construct a code breaking device for Bletchley Park in connection with the Enigma machine used by the German military. Two factors made it challenging for Radley to promote Dollis Hill's technological solutions to Bletchley Park. Firstly, as Christopher Smith's work suggests, managers at Bletchley Park were unreceptive to technological innovation and mechanisation, which was the opposite of post office attitudes. Secondly, there was also a class, clash of personalities between the personnel from the two research establishments, which was likely connected to their different working cultures. Bletchley Park operated on a hierarchy correlating to academic aptitude, which meant senior staff were less likely to have dealt with engineers as equals. With Dollis Hill being predominantly engineers, many of whom who had started their technical education as apprentices, they were less used to working with academics from different social and educational backgrounds. In February 1942, the British government became aware that the German administration was using a four-wheel Enigma machine to cipher messages. This was a more complex version of the three wheel enigma, which had been broken using an electro electromagnetical device called the bomb designed by Alan Turing and installed at Bletchley Park in March 1940. Commander Edward Travis, the head of Bletchley Park, requested post office assistance. This could have been regarded as a step highlighting that the team at Bletchley Park regarded the post office as an equal. However, while Radley visited Bletchley Park on the 24th of February, shortly after the first intercept of this new code, he was, um, he was critical, um, he, he, he criticised that the assistance of the post office had not been consulted sooner. Several devices were proposed, including an adapted bomb with two attachments, the commutator and the electronic bow sensing unit. The former, codenamed COBRA, was built by a team at the Telecommunications Research Establishment under the direction of physicist Charles Wynne Williams. But there were competing ideas about how best to construct the sensing unit. Harold Dockeen from the manufacturer of British tabulating machines, who built the original bomb, proposed a relay, relay sensing electromagnetic mechanical system, which had Wynne Williams' support. And Tommy Flowers suggested a scheme which used fouls. Bradley gained support from Travis for the Dollis Hill design of the sensing unit by reframing the debate as one for which post office expertise was most suitable. This is demonstrated in a letter from Bradley, which he wrote, quote, in conversations you have from time to time generously indicated that you regard Flowers and myself as your technical advisors with regard to the use of telephone switching equipment. This approach proved successful as following a meeting in Westminster in December 1942, Bradley convinced Travis to agree to the post office constructing 72 sensing units to their design as a backup to the Wynne Williams devices, even though there was no guarantee that they would be used. 
This positioning was criticised by Gordon Welkman, head of Hut 6 at Bletchley Park and responsible for breaking Enigma ciphers. He wrote of his concerns to Alistair Denison, Travis's equivalent in charge of the civil wing of the government code and cipher school. In the letter, Weltman complained that, quote, for a long time I have been worried about Commander Travis's apparent attitude to um, BTM and have wondered how much influence Dr. Radley was exerting in the background. In particular, his insistence of keeping Dollis Hill happy without apparently worrying about the feelings of British Tabulating Machine Company has put me in a really difficult position. He continued to argue that this situation had arisen because Radley, quote, had the reputation of Dollis Hill in mind and that he has been acting as salesman. Accusations of technical incompetence were used by Bletchley Park and Dollis Hill to dismiss opposing sensing unit designs. Writing to Denniston again, Welkman criticised Flower's working methods. Quote, Dr. Wynne Williams has found it difficult to get on with the Dollis Hill people and feels that Mr. Flower's idea of cooperation is to run things himself. <laughs> and his engineering abilities, claiming that, quote, Flowers was probably very good at his ordinary work and also very good at designing apparatus for a definite problem that he can understand. And believing this task to be beyond his capabilities, quote, I found him very slow at grasping the complications of our work and his mind seems to be altogether inflexible. Equally, the post office were highly critical of the other team's work especially that of BTM, and reportedly, quote, attacked Keane, both to his competence as an engineer and as to the actual relay system which he had designed. Frustrations over the delays of the project led Flowers to argue that, quote, it was a scandal that after 15 months, BTM had not got a machine running. Despite Welkman arguing that, quote, the influence of Dr. Radley and Mr. Flowers must be completely removed from the bomb project, with Travis's support, the post office was approached again to support another problem. This related to the decryption of intercepted teleprinting messages given the name Tunney by Bletchley Park, encrypted on a 12-wheel Lorentz cipher machine. Much more secure than the Enigma code, Tunney was used to send messages between the German high command. This challenge, also involving Wynne Williams, was to construct an electronic counting device to be used um, on the Heath Robinson the first machine designed to break the tiny message. The Heath Robinson work suffered, um, sorry, the, the Heath Robinson worked, but suffered from technical issues, including trouble sustaining the synchronization of two teleprinter tapes at high speed, which was required for the statistical method used to identify five wheel settings of the cipher. It was also slow, taking several hours to resolve one message. Yet again, flowers cause friction by suggesting replacing the Heath Robinson with a fully electronic machine in which the information of one of the tapes would be generated internally, removing the synchronization problem and speeding up the process. Flowers recounted that his suggestion was meant was met with in um, incredible. Oh gosh, I can't, can't pronounce. Sorry, the words. Thank you, everyone in the audience helping me. <laughs> Um, by senior staff at TRE and Bletchley, who did not believe his designs would work, and if it did, it would take too long to construct. Their main concern was that Flowers' machine relied on thousands of high-speed valves, which were considered temperamental. However, through his work designing electronic exchanges before the war, Flowers knew that they could be efficient if they were left on and never switched off. In defence of post office skills and knowledge, and with no guarantee Bletchley Park would accept the machine, Radley provided Flowers with staff, funding, and privileged access to the workshops at Dollis Hill, which enabled a prototype to be built in 10 months. A successful demonstration of the machine at Dollis Hill in November 1943 changed the opinions of Bletchley Park staff. Vindicated, the post office staff delivered Colossus, as it became known, to Bletchley Park on 18th of January 1944, as seen in um, uh, Flowers' diary entry. Bradley was right to describe the equipment as a major development, the comparison being made between a message tape and patterns set up by an electronic um, commutator, commutator um, as it ran 15 times faster than the Heath Robinson. <clears throat> Colossus immediately doubled the codebreaker's output, and in March, Bletchley Park ordered more to be built. Bradley's, gam Bradley's gamble was justified when, for the, following the delivery of Colossus 2 to Bletchley Park in June 1944, the research branch was authorised an expenditure of £80,000 to build further colossi and associated code-breaking machines. 
This was a sizable figure, equivalent to 11% of the total annual expenditure of the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research that year, which funded 2,471 staff across 12 research establishments. In other realms, the research branch immediately proved its expertise and carved out an unchallenged, unique role in the wartime state. This was the case with the development of bugging equipment and recording devices, which following the first installation in the prisoner of war camp held in the Tower of London, led to supporting human intelligence activities in many theatres of war. Through word of mouth, the research branch ended up supporting a range of activities for several branches of the Directorate of Military Intelligence, a department of the War Office, this included domestic counterintelligence with MI5, secret intelligence service, MI6, and signals intelligence, MI8. Unlike Dollis Hill's role in Bletchley Park projects, which came to the fore in 1942 and peaked in 1944, this work was in high demand throughout the war, and in terms of secrecy was considered of equal importance. This work was led by assistant engineer Jimmy Doust, who became the post office liaison with the security services. So Radley was more successful at selling post office skills to the government departments which did not have their own dedicated R&D establishments, such as those sections of the Directorate of, Mil of Mil Ministry Intelligence. Donis Hill faced stronger competition at Bletchley Park, which was in itself a research organisation whose senior staff have close connections to TRE through shared personal experience, class and education. The dismissal of the equipment designed by Flowers, which used new electronic techniques support Smith's findings that Bletchley Park was cautious about untested technologies. However, in the case of Colossus, the potential value and prestige for Bletchley Park project was worth going ahead with Flowers' design at the expense of other Dollis Hill projects. So while, Rad while Radley achieved in positioning the research station in some realms, this was not a complete immersion and missed out on benefits which came from being a full actor in the wartime state including control over decision making, access to resources and maintaining staff. By the end of the war, there were 800 staff in the research branch, nearly double the pre-war number. Most of this large increase was due to the Colossus project, which following the success of the first Colossus, Bletchley Park ordered 12 more to be delivered roughly monthly. This placed an immense strain on the research station and a further 30 staff from across the engineering department were allocated to the project <laughs> with, experience, with expertise in exchange maintenance and construction. Six of these were eventually transferred to Bletchley Park to maintain the equipment. Further staff were assigned to the project from the circuit laboratory and telephone branch, from other research groups and on loan from the regions. <clears throat> By April 1944, 68 staff were engaged in Flowers' laboratory on the construction of the Colossus and tunnel machines, with support from the whole, Do whole of Dollar Hill's workshops. This included other projects being banned from using the workshop for a month. Hmm. By the end of the war, half the research station were working on the projects managed by Doust and Flowers in support of military intelligence. In order to support military projects, Dollis Hill adopted a, a military culture. This became necessary as a research branch took on an increasingly large number of requests from the Directorate of Ministry Intelligence and from 1942, the Foreign Office, who managed Bletchley Park. Compartmentalization ensured that secrets were protected from leaving Dollars Hill, as well as establishing an internal secrecy between staff, where few people had an overview of a complete project. This was notoriously effective at Bletchley Park, where, as Christopher Gray has observed, this type of secrecy led to multiple in and out groups. The war transformed Dollis Hill from an overwhelmingly civilian research station to a clandestine military establishment. And during this period, the research station both exploited the opportunities that arose from the military alignment and looked to mitigate the risks of this approach. The military project represented an opportunity to widen the research branch's knowledge base in adjacent technologies, covert listening and switching equipment, and to gain experience in delivering longer term research as seen in the use of valves in Colossus. Equally, equally, it found itself with opportunities to access resources and staffing position, uh, provisions accorded to defence linked organisations, which ultimately led to a greater prestige across government and military. The introduction of compartmentalisation um, had a, a familiar feature of wartime management, which restricted access to information had a significant impact on Dollars Hill culture. 
Much of the work had, in the interest of security, been so subdivided that its application was not recognisable by the officers engaged. <coughs> this led the head of research, Bradley, to comment in 1942 that never has there been a time when so many knew so much, uh, so little about so much. I'll say that again. Never has there been a time where so many knew so little about so much. Although easy to introduce, through the pre-war structure of the research branch, it led to a dissatisfaction amongst staff, frustrated <laughs> at not knowing how they were supporting the war effort. By the end of the war, senior staff at Dollars Hill had firmly established themselves as the source of expertise at designing and constructing equipment to solve specific military problems. However, these activities were not shared as part of an internal narrative of the research branch, so few of the staff knew of their significant contribution. As the Second World War came to an end and the Cold War began, the post office and research station faced competing pressure to re-establish and advance public communication networks while continuing to meet military demands from the government. Most challenging was the large telephone subscriber waiting list, which had grown during the conflict. While most post office activities were hampered by cuts to capital investment, the prestige of research remained high and the research station was a means by which the department could meet some of its aims. However, despite there being widespread enthusiasm for science and technology as a tool for post-war reconstruction, government policies designed, designed to encourage expansion and growth in R&D actually disadvantaged the aspirations of managers in the research branch. On the 5th of April 1946, the Post Office Board approved the Engineer-in-Chief Sir Stanley Angwin's Memorandum on the Future of Research in the Post Office. This ambitious proposal was based on three key aspirations to be achieved by 1950. The first was to build the, the, up the research organisation to the full capacity of the Dollars Hill site. Second, to redirect research work away from day-to-day -day concerns towards more fundamental and long-term investigations. And third, to expand the, the workforce by doubling the number of senior staff and increasing the number of those who have been scientifically trained. In order to increase capacity at Dollars Hill, development work was transferred from the research station to other branches in the engineering department. Unlike the experience of the wider post office, which was restricted in its spending, the Treasury helped facilitate Angwin's ambitions by agreeing to support changes to increase the capacity of Dollars Hill and for more long-term fundamental research. Factors that would have influenced the Treasury support were the research station's prestige, evidence, of its contribution to the wider government's aims during the war and the promise that research would continue to support cost saving and increase profits. profits. There was a cross-party support for the research station, heralded as the source of the post office's efficiency with calls to increase its funding. The support for Dollars Hill was indicative of a widespread enthusiasm for R&D across government and industry as this tool for post-war reconstruction. And as a result, the state increased financial support to industrial research by more than half between 1945 and 1951, which enabled the expansion of R&D establishments and industry across the country. With Treasury support, the post office managers were able to request changes to the research station site and increase its capacity by relocating its development work away. Um, while working to support the needs of the post office, staff at the research station were still expected to contribute to wider government concerns, such as defence work and other civilian projects. Although a drain on resources, these activities were considered an opportunity for the post office to align itself with both warfare and welfare priorities of the post-war government. So while there, I've shown there was all of this support for Angwin's proposal, um, it was challenged by government policies that were looking to kind of, you'd imagine, align with the post offices. So the export drive, which resulted in the prioritisation of funds and materials to other industries that weren't the post office. Uh, the direction of R&D investment prioritised Britain's nuclear weapons programme and also affected the allocation of scientific manpower. While the research branch had the potential to develop its research programme, it was limited by the workforce it was available to hire. And with that treasury support, the post office could not compete with expanding sites and expanding state and private R&D establishment, which promised better opportunities or were connected to nationally prestigious projects perceived as more glamorous by new graduates. This was more, made more challenging as there was more demand for university trained scientists than supply. 
Dollars Hill eventually became distanced from the wider engineering department as managers attempted to attract and retain the required staff. And while the post office was able to benefit from some government processes, such as hiring experts from Germany through the Darwin scheme, there was still the expectation that Dollars Hill would release senior staff on secondment to work on defence projects if required. It is in this difficult balance between meeting civil and military requirements which made, made the post office's post-war experience unique. Despite being well funded, there were drains on the research station resources as the post office was asked or expected to work on projects for other government departments. The post office did not always receive payment for these activities. For example, the cost of research undertaken at Dollars Hill for top secret intelligence projects were borne by the post office funds, reportedly, quote, under the special financial procedure which, which exists for losing sight of such amounts at a high level. This was despite the existence of the secret vote, a budget allocated to cover this type of covert activity. Although this funding arrangement did not directly affect the research station's budget, the cost in terms of staff time was not compensated. This was not, however, always at the post office's expense. A balance was struck between undertaking work not connected directly to post office concerns, which absorbed much needed staff time for the post-war research programme, which were often senior engineers due to the sensitivity of the request or level of the expertise required, and the opportunities and prestige gained by the research station by delivering certain projects. This friction is illustrated by the research station's involvement in developing computers for the MPL and Ministry of Supply. So having demonstrated their engineering experience in the Colossus code-breaking machine, Angwin was approached by the director of MPL, Sir Charles Darwin, in February 1946 to support the construction of one of Britain's first electronic stored programme computers, the automatic computing engine ACE. ACE was the brainchild of the mathematician and Bletchley Park codebreaker Alan Turing, a combination of his pre-war theoretical work and his practical wartime experience constructing the bomb machine. Despite Radley's hesitation about Dollis Hill supporting computing work, he agreed to give the project the highest priority, enthused by, quote, the fascinating nature of the task and the prestige value. Internally, Radley justified the research branch's involvement in the project as an opportunity to develop techniques which could be applied to electronic switching, which promised a more efficient and cheaper telephone service for the post office. <coughs> Initially, Tommy Flowers and two of his Colossus engineers, Alan Coombs and William Chandler, were allocated to the ACE project, which started with the construction of a prototype computer, the Pilot ACE. But despite Radley's early enthusiasm, a combination of staffing issues and more immediate post office needs meant Flowers, who had been specifically requested by Darwin, was removed from the project to work to develop telephone switching techniques solely for post office needs. Even with the expertise of Coombs and Chandler, the leader of the ACE project, John Wormsley, raised concerns that it was not ideal to separate this work out. The engineering responsibility for the ACE project was eventually transferred to NPL in autumn 1947, once it had established its own electronics team. Bradley reported that this decision provided some relief uh, to the research branch to focus on post office projects. Around the same time that Solis Hill was removed from the NPL project, the Ministry of Supply approached the post office to build a digital computer to calculate aircraft trajectories for radar data. According to Coombs, he persuaded Bradley to accept the Ministry of Supply request as he was keen to, quote, try this new art of digital computer development. However, Bradley's decision may also be shaped by wanting the support of the Ministry of Supply, the largest single funder of state and private R&D during this period. For example, the Atomic Energy Research Establishment, founded in January 1946, received the same amount of funding from the Ministry of Supply as the total of of the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research that year. The Ministry of Supply was an important patron as, a high, um, as high investment in defence research trickled down to private firms who won contracts to manufacture equipment and were allocated R&D projects. GEC, Ferranti and Imperial Chemical Industries all benefited from defence work. Ferranti used funds from the Ministry of Supply to work on guided missiles for de development work on computers. Hundreds of firms supported the Atomic Energy Project, but ICI was the largest benefic beneficiary, receiving £4.25 million between 1946 and 1952. Coombs and Chandler took responsibility for the Ministry of Supply Automatic Integrator and Computer, Mosaic for short, 
which was based on version seven of Turing, Turing's logical design for ACE. Part of the machine was, were also informed by the EDSAC computer at Cambridge. Coombs reported that Mosaic was poorly resourced. Quote, it was just Chando and I who designed every scrap of that machine and a couple of data recorders as well, which involved complicated processes with cathode ray tubes. This was less support than was allocated to both EDSAC and ACE, which were built by teams of researchers. Like the ACE project, it's possible that this was all that Bradley could or wanted to spare while keeping the Ministry of Supply satisfied. There was also friction between senior members of the engineering department about whether the post office should support Mosaic at all. In a meeting of the Coordination Committee in 1951, the engineering chief, Archibald Gill, stated that, quote, he deplored the fact that the post office should still be burdened with commitments outstanding since the last war. In response, the new controller of, re of the research station, Lionel Harris, claimed that, quote, effort on this development has not been a complete loss to the post office, as much had been learned, um, which was of use in the development of electronic switching. The machine was eventually delivered to Malvern sometime between late 1952 and early 1953, and contained 6,480 electronic valves and about 2,000 semiconductors. This project may have strengthened the relationship between the post office, Dollis Hill, and the Ministry of Supply, but it did not give um, the research station privileged access to all the materials. Short supplies of steel meant that, 90, meant that the 95 mercury delay lines required for Mosaic were designed around the only source readily available, steel tubes used by welders. <clears throat> Overall, Donis Hill went some way to meet its own ambition, ambitions, prioritising areas of research which reduced costs, improved services and gained prestige. Alongside undertaking work with immediate applications which could align the post office with wider government defence and civil aims, resources at Donis Hill were steadily directed to longer term projects and investigations of a more fundamental nature. In 1948, Gill reported that four long term projects had been prioritised around the available staff Areas which, have not, which were not being investigated elsewhere, which seemed the most profitable. These were submerged telephone repeaters, the modernisation of the subscriber's telephone, an electronic telephone exchange, and the mechanisation of letter sorting. All of these had received some attention in the 1930s, and though, although they had been officially suspended during the war, the experience gained directly or indirectly helped shape the project <coughs> in the post-war period. Each project promised cost savings, increased capacity, improved efficiency, and had potential to support the export market. And by 1950, the research branch had gone some way towards annual ambitions. Implementing the long-term and fundamental research, adapting areas of the site, and increasing the number of senior positions, although these roles were not easily filled. So what we see from this period is that the research supports David Edgerton's argument that Britain's immediate post-war priorities were tilted more heavily towards liberal militaristic defence spending rather than social democratic welfare spending. Not only did this divert funds away from civilian requirements, such as the National Telephone Network, but also the post office budget was used to finance military projects for both large infrastructure and covert intelligence work undertaken by Dollars Hill staff. The identity of the research station became confused during this period, treated as a civilian focused R&D establishment, but having proved itself experts during the Second World War, was expected to continue to support military needs without, favorable, without the favourable conditions of defence institutions. <laughs> While Dollis Hill's unique character meant the post office could gain patronage and prestige by simultaneously aligning to the government's warfare and welfare needs, this did not redirect resources away from deep. This did redirect resources away from departmental needs. During the 1950s, the post office continued to harness high technological visions emanating from Dollis Hill to align its research activities with government aims, thus safeguarding <laughs> funding and protecting staff. Whilst the promotion of technologies was a well-established post office strategy. During this period, the department attempted to associate itself with a new rhetoric around British scientific research. A major route to prestige was to be one of the institutions seen to shape Britain's post-war identity by delivering scientific and technological firsts. Robert Budd has described this as a time of defiant modernism. 
a period which saw the first civilian jet airliner comet, the first civil nuclear power station called a hall, and a number of world speed records. Queen Elizabeth II, the new young monarch on the throne, became symbolic of the country's modernizing ambitions and through association legitimized new technology. While the post office's aspirations intersected with this defiant modernism trend of other national prestige projects, its contribution was not in the form of imposing architecture like the towers at Calder Hall power station or the unusual structure of the Mark I telescope at Jodrell Bank. Instead, it was through infrastructure. As very little of this infrastructure was publicly visible, this posed a unique challenge in its promotion, particularly um, concerning the economic imperative to sell British technology abroad. This was a necessary element of international trade, but new technologies also became symbols of progress and that national prestige. Bodies like the National Research Development Council were established to support um, this aim, and that became an influential sponsor in the development of Britain's computer industry. By contributing to this agenda, the post office sought to demonstrate the value of its research activities at Dollars Hill to a skeptical public experiencing long waiting lists for telephone connections. With reasonable freedom over the research agenda at Dollars Hill, the post office continued to take on a breadth of activities which aligned with and supported the government's civil and military aims. So while science was a means by which the government could project its power, Policies restricted departmental advertising, thus limiting the post office's opportunities for such engagement. The central office of information remained the gatekeeper for government publicity, under whose rules the post office was barred from advertising its achievements or publicising the work of its staff in print, films or posters. The mediums that had made the post office famous in the interwar period were not regarded as a good use of public money. In spite of many restrictions, the post office was able to promote its work through exhibitions which promoted British goods for export and encouraged scientific careers. More than ever, the launch of new services became an important opportunity to gain prestige, press coverage and shape public opinion. And where possible, the post office sought to secure the Queen's involvement in these publicity activities to associate its new technologies with the modern monarch. At the same time, in the face of fears around increased mechanisation and automation, the post office humanised new um, automated technologies to build public trust. Whilst, whilst familiar publicity methods were just denied to the post office uh, in this period, Dollis Hill's work remained central to the public's portrayal of a modern, efficient organisation. The post office humanised and in some cases anthropomorphised its equipment to build public trust in its new unfamiliar technologies. This had started in 1936 with Tim, the speaking clock, but became a recognisable marketing strategy during the 1950s to manage national concerns about the impact of mechanisation on jobs and society. As part of this strategy, the post office consistently and consciously used common names for all their devices. Mm. Examples include ESME, the electronic speaking machine, ELSI, the electronic letter sorting indicating equipment and ALF, automatic letter facer. The tea shop and computer company Lyons used a similar tactic, naming its computers Leo to make them seem approachable. The post office used the popular image of computers to describe their new services. Since the immediate post-war years, computers have been described in the popular press as, quote, electronic brains. This means there was a lexicon in place. By the, post, by the time the post office start producing its own information machines using electronic components. This is seen in the post office's description of race, which despite being a registered translator was referred to as, quote, a robot telephone operator and being, quote, the brain of the new system. Computers were projected as national symbols of prestige and may explain why some post office projects which were not core to the department's activities were promoted. We've already noted that um, there was a dispute amongst senior members of the engineering department around whether the research station should be involved in the mosaic project. And despite the anomalous nature of the project, the computer was publicized through machinery and large scale photographs at the Dollars Hills opening day in 1951 and 1954, and also in the press. Perhaps the most famous anthropomorphized machine built at Dollars Hill was the vehicle by which the new premium bond schemes was, public, was published, um, publicised. 
This enables the post office to promote itself through a new government service. Premium bonds were announced by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Harold Macmillan, in April 1956 as part of his savings budget, aimed to get getting more people to save money. Bonds could be bought in 23 denominations between £1 and £1,000 from any post office counter. That's continuing the department's role as the interface between the state and its people. Or, as one research engineer described it, quote, the government's made of all work. Mm -hmm. Premium bonds were new and exciting, and the post office benefited from being connected to a service which promised the chance of winning a life-changing amount of money. The scheme received a lot of press, of a public and press attention, and the first draw, which took place in June 1957, was televised and widely reported on. The post office also demonstrated its usefulness to the state by constructing the machine which generated the winning numbers. The electronic random number indicator equipment, known as Ernie, was built at Dollis Hill by a sizable team working under Tommy Flowers. With £25,000 allocated to the project by the government, Ernie was an opportunity to use new processes on a large scale, including printed circuits, rectangular loop ferrites and transistors. Not only did the research branch construct Ernie, but they also became part of its promotion. Before completing the full-scale version, the team at Dollars Hill constructed a demonstration model, which became part of the publicity drive. Mini Ernie was the perfect vehicle for the post office to promote its work and introduce a friendly and trustworthy machine. The model was designed to explain how Ernie worked, frequently photographed with the Postmaster General Charles Hill and shown at public exhibitions. Unlike the full-sized Ernie, which was composed of five racks with exposed circuit boards and electronic components, the model had a veneer cabinet, likely chosen as it was more reminiscent of the kind of television or radio set someone might have at home, than a computer which took up a large, very large space. Another difference was the small version produced two random numbers displayed on dials which looked a lot like eyes, rather than the 11 numbers generated by Ernie and printed by teleprinter. Once the final version was complete, the team at Dollars Hill were tasked with explaining Ernie's operation to journalists. While it might have been practical to keep Ernie's cabinets uncovered for adjustments and cooling, it is possible that by making the machine as transparent as possible, the post office hoped to meet public concerns about its true randomness. Ernie was further anthropomorphized, becoming the face of premium bonds and appeared on mugs and money boxes. In this presentation, Ernie looked like the equipment as designed, showing instead, um, sorry, Ernie looked little like the equipment as designed, shown instead as a humanized robot, likely reflecting the popular images at the time. Although challenged by government policy, the post office utilized all opportunities to promote itself. Despite restrictions on uh, the post office used many tactics from exhibitions to Ernie to ensure this publicity. And the publicity around new services and technological advances shaped the post office's prestige. The biggest change from the early days of the research station was that by 1950s, the site itself was not part of the narrative of the modern post office, as it no longer fitted the image of the work being undertaken within, nor the outputs of those investigations. The promotion of Dollars Hill as a site was no longer required to justify the existence of a research station to the taxpayer, or legitimised post office expertise. While the engineering department claimed that the principal purpose of the work at Dollars Hill is to maintain and improve the efficiency of the telecommunications services which the post office provides to the, the public, we have seen that the identity of the research station was flexible, adapting to meet the needs of government. This explains the often unexpected activities of the station, which built on the knowledge of research staff but were not directly linked to the post office. While Dollis Hill's staff worked on defence projects for the Ministry of Supply, this contribution was suppressed when the Minister of Supply, Duncan Sands, um, Sanders, was asked in the Commons to justify the existence of two government-funded telecommunication R&D establishments, the Research Station and TRE. To differentiate, Sanders described the former as working on the public communication services of the post office, while the latter developed equipment for the RAF and naval aviation. A dual identity coexisted within Dollars Hill, as the culture of secrecy ran seamlessly alongside the wider social activities which took place on the site. Cliff Wandsworth joined Dollars Hill in 1953 at the age of 16 after finishing school at the local Wilson Technical College. 
Although knowing that a fellow member of the Dollis Hill Running Club worked in the, quote, ultra secret place, Wandsworth never asked what he did down there and he never told us. There was an awareness within Dollis Hill that the secret research was happening, but with most staff signing the Official Secrets Act, including Wandsworth, there was an understanding not to ask questions. The Dollis Hill site became a limiting factor on the research activities within the research station. Dollis Hill, having been built for 800, became uncomfortably overcrowded. Despite doing everything they could to improve the facilities, including adapting buildings which were not suitable for research work, staff were still constrained by the congested site. The success of the post office's strategy of using Dollis Hill to navigate between military and civilian projects while delivering on some of their own technological promises, ironically rendered Dollis Hill, the Dollis Hill site obsolete. While Dollis Hill had been constructed to meet the needs of the 1930s post office, a new site offered the opportunity to design a research station encompassing and projecting the department's modern aspirations through its environment, facilities and design. Despite this, staff continued to work at the research station until 1975, when the Queen formally opened Martlestrom Heath. The new site was a university-inspired campus reflecting modern aims for a modern post office. Whilst Dollis Hill had outlived its useful life, its ethos remained as research staff walked into Martlesham Heath beneath a sign which read, research is the door to tomorrow. Dollis Hill was unlike any other 20th century British R&D establishment. While government funded, it does not fit into a recognisable model of a state institution. <coughs> Although undertaking work for the military, it did not receive the benefits of defence sponsored laboratories. Despite shaping the telecommunications equipment manufactured and sold by private firms, its contributions to the business activities of the post office were subject to strict state control. This anomalous identity enabled Dollis Hill to move beyond its remit of investigating cost savings, setting standards and developing new technologies to improve communication services owned and operated by the post office to play a significantly and undiscussed role in the Second World War, post-war reconstruction and Cold War. While the research station and its outputs cannot be exclusively ca categorised by either the welfare state or the warfare state to employ David Edgerton's categories, this thesis shows it was clearly embedded in both. So um, just to kind of wrap up the talk, Dollis Hill and its research activities were framed by senior staff in the engineering department as the location of post office cost saving and service improvements. This interpretation was shared with the public and wider government to justify the state sponsorship of research during the periods of economic uncertainty. Demonstrating the value of research supported post office claims that it was working to reduce the costs of services for its users. A more effective approach to increase research funding was through the promise of new, technological cap new technologies capable of reaching the export market and cutting manufacturing costs. Yeah. Such proposals designed to attract and successfully did attract treasury support at a time when capital, cuts to capital were restricting the development of post, office, of post office's domestic service. So this paper is, and um, my wider thesis is not a story of individual visionaries. Uh, the tra trajectory of the post office research was inevitably defined strongly by both bureaucratic and technological networks. However, my findings show that two individuals influenced the course of events in directions that may not have otherwise taken place. And um, as with all these projects, it's an opportunity to highlight the work of people who up to this point have not had uh, received the credit they deserved. So post-war, Engineering Chief Stanley Angwin successfully convinced the Post Office Board and Treasury to support a more scientific research programme in the research branch. This led to the removal of the training and development work from Dollis Hill, a commitment to more long-term and fundamental research and an expansion of scientific roles. This shift meant Dollis Hill could seek benefits available to other government departments. Gordon Radley was the most influential actor in shaping the research culture at Dollis Hill, not only heading up the research station during the 1940s, but as engineer-in-chief and later the first engineer to become director general of the post office. To protect research station resources, increase patronage and further, um, increase prestige and further patronage, Bradley shaped Dollis Hill's research agenda to fit both the post office and wider government priorities, whether these were macroeconomic, civilian or defence led. This ensured a place for Dollis Hill and the post office in the key activities of both the warfare and welfare state. Dollis Hill was 
both the site where the post office research agenda was realized and and um, pursued and a carefully managed symbolic representation of this activity. The research at Dollars Hill was publicized to show the post office engaging in prestigious modern research for the benefit of the nation, countering critiques that the organization was inefficient and antiquated. Messages around new developments and services were a key part of the post office's 1930s modernizing campaign, but policy changes limiting departmental publicity post-war meant that the activities of the research station became the increasingly became the only means by which the post office could share its success. The research station and its outputs provided a highly visible artifacts to represent the post office's predominantly invisible infrastructure, displaying submarine repeaters in exhibitions and demonstrating the anthropomorphized Ernie enabled post the post office to contribute to the defiant modernism of the 1950s alongside other aesthetic icons of British progress. Throughout, the promise of new technology shaped by Dollar Hill research was shared in publicity, commercial accounts and parliamentary debates, enabling the post office to trade on future visions at a time when they were struggling to provide an established service. For the post office, the fruits of research were not just in improving communication equipment, but also a key factor in securing and maintaining patronage at a time when domestic telephone services were considered a luxury. So the post office exploited the flexibility of the research station to realize additional benefits by aligning with wider government aims. Senior staff at Dollars Hill saw the high status projects via civilian and military patronage to gain prestige and knowledge which could be applied to post office developments. Another example of this in the post-war period is the development of Madresco, the first hearing aid that was released on the NHS. The motivations behind aligning with military need were most clearly revealed during the Second World War, when faced with starved losses and reduced access to material stocks, Bradley maneuvered Dollars Hill into the wartime state through persuasion and perseverance. When research station expertise was dismissed by Fletchley Park, Bradley persisted regardless by identifying and quoting the key stakeholders and in the case of Colossus, reprioritizing Dollars Hill's resources away from other research commitments in the short term in the hope of future patronage. So this paper uh, highlighted the unique place by which Dollars Hill negotiated itself by utilizing its research outcomes for the benefits of the agendas of governments in time of war and peace. So other factors were present in motivating post office decision making at this time, including self preservation and reputation alongside any welfare and warfare considerations. The weighting attached to these influences shifted depending on the priorities of the post office at any one time. Senior post office staff strategically steered the research station between warfare and welfare patrons by sitting outside recognizable models of R and D. And whilst this flexibility meant that Dollar Hill resources could be directed to what, whichever customer best suited post office aims to reduce costs and improve mm -hmm. services, the research station did not fully benefit from the access obtained by those in a fixed category. It was Dollar Hill's uniqueness which enabled it to adapt to serving both these needs, and in doing so, new layers of distinctiveness emerged, setting it apart from other R&D models. Badley's post-war plans to return to civilian telecommunications research were complicated by the emerging Cold War and the opportunities presented by the growing um, welfare state. Defence work ensured resources were retained in Dollars Hill, whilst the welfare state represented an opportunity to strengthen the post office's status within government. Changes to the site and culture resulted in the adoption of military secrecy, and it's testament to Dollars Hill's post office identity that for most, this was not impactful. Friendships were maintained and social clubs continued to thrive. Most notably during the Second World War, Tommy Flowers remained head of the horticultural uh, <laughs> society at Dollars Hill. Furthermore, senior Dollars Hill staff and um, staff's consideration of status or national need in selecting their research priority not only accounts for the varied and perhaps unexpected outputs of a post office research station, it means it's possible to trace national trends of technological enthusiasm through the activities of the research station. Uh, thank you for listening, uh, and I welcome any questions.
I've got to get this working again. Can you, is this, am I audible? Okay. Am I audible? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, so I don't think it's through that microphone, but we can do Oh, okay. <laughs> well, do you want to just stand next to me? Okay. <laughs> you might pick up one of my Oh, no. Should I walk with you? <laughs> well, um, as you say, now for questions yes. and comments. There's one um, I've got from um, Tim Lyons from Zoom. Uh, quite a provocative question. Uh, Tim, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, yes, it's just, uh, do you feel that by being obliged to do both general government research and post office research, it did neither very well, that it, it didn't really do as much post office research as it should have done. Um, Tim, I'm also going to get your question up just so I can, I believe I should be able to see it. It's the Is it a second bottom? to bottom one. Second to bottom, brilliant. Well, thanks for that. Um, I think, um, bear with me a sec. Sorry, Tim, I think I'm just um, getting my, oh, here we go. It's about oh, yes, I, I, I spotted, <laughs> I spotted it. Um, that is a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, um, hmm. it is a good question. It's, it's been repeated in the room how good a question it is. Um, I think, I think it kind of depends on um, kind of what we're comparing it to. Um, there are some case studies that I did talk about today um, where con the contribution of the post office was, was delivered the research. So most um, particularly around um, the development of the transatlantic telephone cable um, and uh, TAP1, which was installed um, across the Atlantic in 1956, um, mm -hmm. partly because of this um, limitations on publicity um, AT&T and Bell Labs, who were delivering the kind of American side of the project, they uh, really had the opportunity to celebrate their contribution. And um, that's just an example of where the post office research was really important and delivered on their aims, but potentially wasn't um, celebrated in its own time enough. But I'm sure lots of people on the call and in the room will be aware of um, some of the more or less successful projects um, around uh, electronic switching post-war. So I think it's hard. One of the things that my research has kind of led me to, and I've kept on repeating it about these welfare and warfare ambitions, and while they were definitely part of both, it's really hard to distinguish uh, when you start drilling down into those details, how successful they were, how you how to frame them and how to talk about them. So uh, it's not a very good answer to your question, but I think it's a really good one that I'm probably going to ponder <laughs> over. Um, if you, I, thought, I thought the transatlantic cables was all down to STC. The um, uh, 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 subscriber trunk dialing, I don't think was anything down to, to Dulles Hill. Um, and those are a couple of, of, of post office areas, which... Yeah, that didn't really seem to contribute. It didn't seem to contribute very much. There, there was a bit of contribution from Dollar Hill, um, and uh, I, you know, I've only had a, a limited amount of time, but definitely around um, post-war telephone instruments and standardisation, Dollar Hill were quite involved in that process of you know the testing and calibrating remained, and within uh, the transatlantic cable, there were bits as you commented there were. There was, it was a mixture of government and industry uh, contributing to that project, and Dollars Hill did do specific bits, especially around the repeaters. So it is complex, and I completely agree with you that um, you know some things weren't as successful as others. Um, so sorry, Tim, not answering it exactly as well as I could be, uh, but I really appreciate the question. I, I think that's absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah. It's a, a complicated question, so complicated answer. Did, Um, leading on from that, um, you've talked about some of the success, some of the failures. I wonder if you're, in your researches you came across the Highgate Wood fiasco. Uh, and obviously you did. Yes. Um, 
What impression did you get of that? Uh, yes, um, I did. Um, to the great joy of writing this paper is I got to revisit my PhD, which I finished two years ago. So I apologise if everything isn't completely to hand. Um, uh, bear with me one sec. I've just got some notes that I can um, have a check with. Um, it was also an area that I would really encourage everyone to look at Jacob Ward, who did the, um, the third part of the Donners Hill history. Um, and he had a whole section about Highgate Woods, so I would um, I would comment on that. Let me just remind myself of if I, I'm not sure if it's, let's have a look. Bear with me one second. Um, I'm going to apologise, Dick, in advance and just say that I think I might need to pick this up after the after our chat when I just remind myself of what I talked about. But as you and Tim also touched on, the amount of work they did was vast. I just tried to make today's talk a little bit more focused to the computing stuff, but I do have the answers somewhere. Um, this is when I let myself down by failing to answer any questions effectively. Um, so I think... Um, I think I failed to answer Dick's question. I will pick up <laughs> later on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, Brian. Um, yes, Brian no, no. Um, on Zoom has got his hand up. Brian, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Hi. Well, first of all, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, uh, possibly rather linked to the issue of uh, Highgate um, um, Wood. I was wondering if you have uh, been able to uh, uh, gain much of an understanding of um, what happened to Tommy Flowers in the last few years of his um, involvement with, the, uh, um, with Dollis Hill after the war. Yeah, thanks for that um, question, Brian. So, I probably um, won't be contributing much more than what has been written about him, um, but um, I can just get my notes up. So, um, so a few things that just, I guess, to contribute to his biography. Um, so after the war, uh, Flowers remained at Dollars Hill and continued his pre-war research on electronics, which he applied to exchange designs and also Ernie. Um, and between 1950 and 1965, he was staff engineer and often deputized for the controller of research during this time. So Flowers left the post office in 1964 to work at STC, and he retired there in the 1970s. Um, and I'm sure it, 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 everyone in the room is aware that his role in the construction of Colossus was not publicly recognised until 1976 and on its 70th anniversary BT unveiled a bronze bust to Tommy Flowers at its current research site at Nottingham Peak. So um, as, as a, a classic historian always says, uh, slightly out of my remit, <laughs> um, my, two, my years of doing the PhD um, kind of were aiming towards the end of the 1950s but I think there's still a lot to explore there. And even around the Dollars Hill site, um, he is acknowledged with a, a flowers close. So you, I would um, recommend a, a, a visit to see where Dollars Hill is uh, currently. It's been since um, the research activities moved, it has been converted into flats um, in a gated community, which a few of us managed to sneak into <laughs> to get a feel for the place. Um, but the wider area is really interesting. You can see Gladstone Park, and they also, um, uh, at, for a time, there were some tours of Paddock, which was, um, uh, so I think someone, Bill, in the chat has um, added some information about Paddock, but uh, Sub Britannica um, also do some tours there, so I'd encourage a trip to the site if you can. Um, someone, uh, CR on Zoom has got a question about utilities. Can you unmute yourself, CR, please? Hi. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering whether there are any similar, what were, I guess, public utilities back at that point, um, that were caught in a similar position that you've outlined for Dollis Hill. And the only one that I thought of, just from because of the 
um, Barnes Wallace work was the National Physical Laboratory, but there must have been, I'm guessing, others that are in a, a similar, if not in depth, position as Dulles Hill. Yeah, no, Chris, I think you're you're right. And um, in while well, my thesis kind of highlighted the value of um, an anomalous research establishment in tracing science and state relations, I think some more studies of parallel institutions uh, would reveal whether there were shared trends. So some of the things that I highlighted, which would be of interest in future research, were things like the laboratory of the government chemist, um, as this was a separate department in until 1959 when it was transferred to the DSIR. Um, so it has appeared in, some people have done a bit of work on it, but um, it's really an area of some rich research. And then I think um, some other institutions uh, could also be things like the Regional Electricity Boards, the Central Electricity Generating Board, National Coal Board. So I think that um, one thing that, that me and my two fellow PhD um, candidates um, ex experience of doing a, a, a history on a site that had not received any attention was kind of highlighting the value in shifting away from maybe some of the more uh, frequently historicized. So Bletchley Park, which is brilliant. We've also got the MPL has received quite a bit of attention. I think there's a lot of potential for ICI to have a more uh, a, a kind of more contemporary look at its history um, and the DSIR. So yeah, drilling in uh, reveals these more nuanced um, uh, statuses and hopefully will start challenging the idea that you, you were, were either one or the other. Um, so thanks for that question, Chris, and hopefully I've in, encouraged some people in the room to do, do the research that I've suggested. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Terry. Uh, Thanks for letting me talk, Rachel. I didn't know that Dolly uh, had been so involved in the military side of things. That actually impressed me. A couple of personal interests. Um, have you turned up anything about Harry Fenson, who was a CCS member until about 10 years ago when he passed away? And have you turned anything up about the Nightingale computer or machine that he worked on? Bear with me just one second. So um, I, I um, am aware of um, Harry Benson and, as you mentioned, the Nightingale, but actually it wasn't an uh, area that I did um, any further research into. Um, I think as I think your question is leading to that there's definitely potential for mm -hmm. some research to happen, and I'd be really um, happy to share some of my sources um, shortly before having to submit my PhD, um, the Second World War War Diary. Um, Hill was declassified, so mm -hmm. um, that is available through BT archives and was an incredibly rich resource of actually tracking how involved Dollis Hill were, and um, particularly, um, while you know, we should celebrate Colossus um, as much as we can, I think the work of Jimmy Dowds was of equal importance and interest when thinking about the um, telephone tapping mm -hmm. and actually physically where that meant Dollis Hill staff ended up in Cairo, um, as well as more locally in Trent Park and um, installing listening in equipment for um, uh, where the um, senior generals were held during the Second World War. So I think that whole area is also a great um, uh, area of future research. You'd be surprised how quickly 80,000 words get eaten up <laughs> when you're looking at 50 years of an institution. But thanks for the question and I will then um, refer to my notes and see what I did pull up that may not have ended up in the final thesis. Brian? Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I ask a question which I'll frame first facetiously and then say what's behind it? One is when can we look forward to the book? <laughs> is, is the facetious version. The more serious version is um, have, I mean, you've touched on some absolutely fascinating links, like between Dollars Hill and Ace, and the wider involvement in Dollars Hill in the communications aspects of Colossus. Um, this doesn't appear in the general canon of history of computing. Are you aware of whether there are plans for this stuff to be published either in a generic or a specific way? Um, thanks for the question, Doran. Um, 
as I mentioned earlier, I haven't really looked at this for a couple of years. Um, I, not, not, not just the trauma of finishing a PhD during lockdown number one um, <laughs> and balancing that with a job, but um, actually having gone back to it, I kind of thought, oh, it wasn't as bad as I remembered. Um, so I would be really keen to um, publish from it. And I think actually this has been a really great first step in the audience to share the research and kind of the things that you're all picking up feel really relevant if I'm going to turn this into something more substantial. So while there are no pla imminent plans, um, I really hope to share this more publicly and broadly in the future. And I'd love to speak to anyone who um, has any ideas of places that you think this could sit, um, and also kind of uh, a friendly critic is always appreciated. So please do get in touch with me if you're interested in talking about this more. Thank you. Uh, Brian, you had a question? Uh, Yes, thank you. A very good question. You've got the BT archives, which are available, obviously, to researchers. Is there a similar sort of BT museum of Dollis Hill that is available to the general public, you know? That's a really good question, and I will... Um, so, BT archives is by appointment. Um, they do have some uh, objects in their collections, and they were part of a broader project called Connected Earth, which led to the... Um, uh, the kind of diffusion of the post office collections into lots of different museums. So the Science Museum benefited from that. National Museum of Scotland have things, um, as well as more specific museums. One place I, uh, the only place I found that some of the story of Donaldson is talked about is in um, the local museum in Trent. Um, do I mean Trent? I'm going to get it up so that I don't um, say the wrong, say the wrong word. Um, it was. Yeah, so Brent Museum and Archives, and I'd have to say that they were incredibly um, helpful to me because the archival record is limited, uh, to put it lightly, the, the being able to see that Second World War diary was a real opportunity to and actually dramatically change the direction of my Second World War chapter. The Brent Museum and Archives um, have a small display about Dollis Hill, they've got a disc from the speaking clock and they've got a few kind of testimony of people who work there and specifically they have oral histories of the staff who worked there, um, mostly recorded in 2001 and two as part of a project. So people like Arnold Lynch, uh, Cliff Wandsworth, who I mentioned earlier with his running club, and Ralph Jones um, all have their oral histories there. So um, I'd love to see it celebrated more. And I think with kind of online blogs um, and the nice thing about kind of offering up my research to these places that I've also benefited from. So I would go, go to Brent Museum and Archives. It's a really nice museum. And then you can go look at Dollars Hill. So there we go. <laughs> Sorted a day trip for you. Thank, you. Thank you. May I hand over to you, Doran? Yes, thank you very much, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, the, the task is a vote of thanks. And um, that's not very difficult to do. One mm -hmm. is that the clarity and depth with which you portrayed this massively complex situation and so effectively integrated, you know, what is political, technological and organizational issues, um, I think was superb. And for which we thank you very, very much. Um, I thought that the, um, an airing of the political background to the collaboration in inverted commas between Dollars Hill and Colossus, uh, uh, Bletchley Park, um, is uh, terribly revealing and not nearly emphasized sufficiently uh, in, in the existing canon, um, primarily because not much is known about it. I think it was touched upon in Haig and Priestley's work, um, but I'm not aware of it, that, that it's part of the narrative. And the narrative tends to be an idealized one because there was a collaboration of extraordinary things, of mathematicians, of cryptography, of technology. And I think there are fascinating issues of class, fascinating issues of engineering and academic um, context, mentalities, and approaches, and um, I, I'm delighted to hear more about it. You know, I was delighted to hear that this has now got an airing, and that there is some prospect that this might be pursued. As indeed the connections between Dollars Hill and Ace, I wasn't aware they were as close as you've um, uh, the post office research station at Ace. I wasn't aware that there was that um, closeness. I mean, that is well my ignorance, but the fact that that's been touched upon, I hope, will spark things elsewhere. And uh, there I. Uh, without being patronizing, encourage 
you to publish <laughs> um, whatever researchers in that area you'd be inclined to pursue. Um, so um, it's a huge thanks to you because of the quality. As I say the clarity and depth of the way you presented this very complex situation. And um, I mentioned I used the metaphor earlier on of a black hole in the canon about about Dollars Hill. You know, I say the features in the context of Colossus and Bletchley Park. But um, the light that I was hoping would be shed on this um, has amply been done. And thank you very, very much for a really intriguing, fascinating, and wide-ranging talk. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Very much. my facts from earlier. I really appreciate being invited to speak to you today. It's my first hybrid lecture since the pandemic and I was very happy that it was here. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. well, I had a postscript. You said about Ernie. Hang on. You, it, it, if it's Sorry. worth a postscript, it's worth yeah. a mic. <laughs> it, a, a postscript. You said <laughs> about Ernie, it was designed to uh, allow people to have a life-changing event. In 1965, I had five premium ones and I won £250. Shortly after my wife had been defrauded of a month's salary in an employment dispute and it more than doubled our uh, assets at the time. <laughs> in many ways, it was the foundation for our first uh, deposit in our first house. So <laughs> indeed life-changing. <laughs> and we need to capture those stories as well. So yeah. uh, when, when uh, this look out, I'm sure someone will be inspired to do a, 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 a popular history of, of um, earning and premium bonds. Well, with um, many thanks also. <laughs> we'll now be taking a summer break. Our programme for the next season starts on Thursday, the 15th of September, the third Thursday of the month, which is our usual time and day. And on the 15th of September, John Carrington will be our speaker who founded Cellnet Mercury One to One and was the first CEO of BT Mobile. His presentation will be entitled The Mobile Revolution, The Early Days of Cellular, 1983 to 1993, a personal view. So please register nearer the time via our website, whether you plan to be here or join us via Zoom. And my best wishes for you for the summer. And we all look forward to meeting again in September. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.